calls mankind darkness. I now invite you, if you have Bibles, at least to turn to the Gospel of John, or else please feel free to read the text projected above me. We're going to read from the Gospel of John. This is a New Testament book, and we're going to look at chapter 8, John 8. And we'll read from verse 48 to the end of verse 58. John 8, beginning at verse 48. The Jews answered him, him being Jesus, Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan? That was a racial slur. And demon-possessed. I'm not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. I'm not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. At this they exclaim, now we know that you are demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you, but I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet 50 years old, they said to him, and you have seen Abraham? Very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself slipping away from the temple grounds. This is the word of the Lord. Nothing can be said to be certain, Benjamin Franklin once wrote, except death and taxes. And Jesus in John 8 makes a wonderful statement. He says, if you obey my word, you will never pay taxes again. Now, wouldn't that be amazing? The fact is, what Jesus really says is even more amazing than that. And that is this, if you obey my word, you will never see death. Now, for a lot of people today, and perhaps you're one of them, this is incredulous. This is objectionable. The death rate over the course of history has remained constant. For every person who is born, there is a person who dies. And you should know tonight that this statement of Jesus, objectionable as it is to people in 21st century Canada, was objectionable to people in 1st century Palestine. I said, well, they said to Jesus, you've got to be crazy. Because even Abraham, our great father in the faith, died. Even Abraham, the great Israelite patriarch, did not have a key to eluding death. They literally say to Jesus, who do you think you are? If you obey my word, you will never see death. To understand what Jesus is saying, we need to go back to the first book in the Bible and the early chapters of that book, the book of Genesis, where we read about these two characters with whom you might be familiar, Adam and Eve, and God there in the garden made a threat to Adam and Eve. He said, In the day you eat of the forbidden tree, you will surely die. And as the story goes, Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden tree. They partook of the forbidden fruit. And what happened to them? Well, whatever happened to them, this much is true. They did not die. 
on that day. And the Belgian Confession, this uh, document from the Protestant Reformation from which we read, acknowledges this point, and it says that Adam, by partaking of the fruit, made himself liable to physical death and spiritual death. Which is to say that God didn't follow through with the threat. Because the threat was actually total death, full alienation from God, no fellowship with God. And in that state where there's full alienation from God and total, um, no fellowship with God, there is no joy. There is no happiness. There is no contentment, no satisfaction. There is no possibility of repentance. There is no possibility of forgiveness. But God in his grace moderated the threat. Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit, and they didn't die. And yet what we're going to see today is that they lost important things, which amounted to a kind of punishment. There were five things in particular that they lost, and we want to take the time tonight to go through those things. And so I've identified them in this way. They were now, they now experience legal guilt, which is the loss of innocence, moral depravity, or the loss of purity, painful suffering or the loss of glory, final death or the loss of life, diabolical dominion or the loss of freedom. They lost innocence, purity, glory, life, and freedom, all of which amounted to a kind of punishment the moment they sinned. Well, let's think for a moment about legal guilt. What do we mean by legal guilt. Well, legal guilt is the status of a lawbreaker. If you break the law, you are guilty. And we learn from the Bible, I'm thinking of uh, the book of James, chapter 2, that if you keep the whole law and yet stumble at just one point, you're guilty of breaking the whole law. And Paul says in Romans 3 that the whole world is in fact accountable to God. The whole world is under this law of God, and if we just break one commandment, we break the whole law, and so we are all guilty before the face of God. We all have broken his will and broken his heart. Now, it's clear from the Genesis account that Adam and Eve experienced guilt. And they experienced those things that often accompany guilt, shame and fear, it says in the text of Genesis 3 that Adam and Eve realized that they were naked. Their eyes were opened, and they realized that they were naked. They were characterized by shame and embarrassment and even fear. They wanted to hide themselves from God. These are all expressions in some ways of guilt, all linked to guilt in some way. And it's a fact that humanity experiences guilt. Whether you're a Christian or not, you can be a rank atheist and you will experience guilt. And because of that we have shame and because of that we have fear. Uh, if you study the ancient pagan religions, you will see that there wasn't really a whole lot of trusting the gods, but there was a whole lot of fearing the gods. And I think that's true of Islam today as well. There isn't a lot in the Quran about trusting in Allah. There is a lot about fearing Allah because Allah is so capricious and arbitrary and people are doing wrong and he's going to punish them. Prior to the fall into sin, Adam and Eve didn't have a conscience because there was no gap between who they were and who they were supposed to be. After the fall into sin, by the grace of God, they had a conscience which told them that they were not living the way that they were supposed to live that they were not who they were supposed to be. And that's the experience that we all have. We have a conscience, and our conscience is a witness 
And of what is our conscience a witness? That we are legally guilty. We're not living the way we're supposed to be. Secondly, moral depravity. If legal guilt is the status of a lawbreaker, then moral depravity is the condition of the sinner, the moral condition. It's not quite true, it's not quite accurate to say that Adam and Eve were just guilty when they partook of the forbidden fruit. They were actually guilty the moment they desired to partake of the forbidden fruit, which reminds us that depravity and guilt always go together. They're perfectly conjoined. All of humanity is characterized by moral depravity, by a distorted moral nature. And what the Bible teaches us is that this moral depravity is congenital. Which is to say that in some sense we're born with it. Now there are a hundred different ways of explaining it. And one way is to think of it like this. If you repeat a sin over and over again, it becomes a sinful habit. And the repetition of sinful habits in families reinforces a particular depravity in that family. Which is why it simply isn't true that we are purely individuals. And it simply isn't true that sin is ever exclusively an individual matter. We are always implicated with others. And if you study history, you will find that there are certain times in history and certain places in the world where cultures participated in a particular sin or a particular evil that you didn't find anywhere else in the world. We are implicated in the sins of others. We are born. We have this congenital problem of moral Pollution, the loss of purity. We no longer have innocence. We no longer have purity. Thirdly, painful suffering. From the point of the fall into sin, we didn't only lose our innocence, we didn't only lose our purity, we lost our glory. And in the Genesis account, we learn that there is now pain in childbearing. There is now discomfort in labor. And we've talked in previous services about all the suffering that is attributable to human sin. Most suffering in the world is attributable to human sin. If you were to remove from the world all the suffering that is attributable to sin, what suffering would be left? There would be some suffering, but not much. Most suffering is attributable to human sin. And sin causes all kinds of suffering, emotional suffering, remorse, shame, fear, terror, anxiety. It can cause illness, poverty, pain, all sorts of things. And then, of course, there's the suffering that is brought about by what we sometimes call natural disasters or natural evils. If you think of earthquakes and hurricanes and floods and famines. Suffering that we think often is not really traceable to sin, but maybe it is. A lot of climate scientists will say today that the frequency with which we are seeing hurricanes and floods is attributable to the, you know, human pollution. But even if you don't buy that argument, we learn in Genesis that the ground was cursed because of human sin. And as a result, nature degenerates. And branches can turn into thorns. And animals can turn on each other. I was reading Hermann Bavink, a great uh, Dutch Reformed theologian, who was making this case that in the garden, All animals were herbivores. And they weren't devouring each other. But because of the fall into sin and perhaps the absence of proper human care and dominion, the animals turned on each other. And he says, when we see violence and hostility in the animal world, it's a symbol, he says, of sinful human passions and inclinations. The animals are telling us a story. And Paul, in Romans 8, talks about how creation groans, longing to be set free from decay, looking forward to the redemption of the sons of God. From the moment humanity fell into sin, there was the loss of innocence. We are now guilty. 
There was the loss of purity, we are now depraved. There is the loss of glory, we are now suffering. And fourthly, there is the loss of life. And we die. Why is death so necessary? It's interesting, scientists will argue that death is perfectly natural. I want to ask, why is it natural? We have cells in our body that are renewing every day. Why couldn't this process of renewal continue? The forces of aging don't seem to be able to influence children. Why must they influence adults? We have many plants and animals that live much, much longer than humans. Why can't humans live very long? And if scientists are honest, they have to admit that death is as much a mystery as life is. But the fact is, death happens, and it's almost always unwelcome. Where life is taken from us. The absence of innocence, of purity, of glory, of life, and then of freedom, because what we learn is that, again, after Adam and Eve's sin, humanity fell under the sway of the devil or, you know, these dark forces, Satan and his angels, restricting us, limiting us, so that by nature we, are, we serve them. Now, this is a very, very grim picture of humanity post-fall. But this is the picture of humanity in the world. And we want to say tonight, is there any hope for people who've lost innocence, guilt, or lost innocence, purity, glory, life, and freedom? Well, we go to John 8, and Jesus there wants us to consider this vital question, to which family do you belong? To which family do you belong? Because he had said to the Jews, he had said to them, you are slaves of sin. And they said, that's ridiculous, Jesus. We are children of Abraham. He said to them, you are not children of Abraham. You are children of your father, the devil. You do whatever he pleases. And a good segment of humanity is children of their father, the devil, who does whatever he pleases. He's the murderer from the beginning. And if you're part of that family, all you have is guilt, depravity, suffering, death, imprisonment. But Jesus wants us to know that there's another family, and there's another ruler, and that is his family not under the devil, but under his Father, who is the life-giver. And the Father, the life-giver, sent Jesus into the world to restore what is lost, to redress the deprivations that we've just identified. So as for guilt, well, Jesus went to the cross to pay for our sins to satisfy God's justice, to pay back the debt we incurred so that Paul says in Romans 8, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He restores innocence. As for depravity, Jesus came to this earth. He lived as a perfectly obedient person, the Son of God incarnate in human flesh. He ascended into heaven, and from there he poured out onto the uh, people, people who believe in him, his spirit, which is the spirit of the obedient Son of God, and that spirit renews us and cleanses us and sanctifies us. He restores purity. As for suffering, Jesus came to this world and he suffered. He was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. He took suffering as his responsibility. He experienced the worst of suffering on the cross and emerged out of it glorious so that when we suffer today, we suffer with Jesus, but on this pathway from suffering to glory, Jesus has transformed suffering. 
and he has restored glory. As for death, Jesus came to defeat the power of death. This is what he did by means of his resurrection from the grave. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though he dies, yet shall he live. He restores life. As for the diabolical dominion, the dominion of Satan and his angels, Jesus came to do battle with with the devil. He stepped, the Bible says, on the head of the serpent at the cross. He triumphed, Colossians 2, over powers and principalities. He dealt a devastating blow to the devil, rescued the church from the domain of the devil, and now enlists the church in fighting the dark forces. Jesus, son of the life giver, restores innocence, purity, glory, life, and freedom. Well, the question that we need to ask and the question with which we conclude tonight is, to which family do you belong because the future for the one family is quite grim, and yet the future for the family of Jesus is brimming with hope. And Jesus says, whoever obeys my word will never see death. You must trust in Jesus, entrust yourself to him, surrender your life to him, because he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the Son of God who restores whatever was lost at the fall. He restores innocence, purity, glory, life, and freedom. But most importantly for us tonight, he restores us to fellowship with the Father. And when we have fellowship with the Father from whom we were alienated because of sin, we have everything we need and more. And the moment we entrust ourselves to Jesus, we begin to enjoy the life of the Father, which is eternal life. An eternal life of innocence, purity, glory, life, and freedom. Let's pray together. Our gracious God, it doesn't take much for us to recognize that humanity is in a perilous situation. We know this in part because we experience the peril in our own lives. And we're not immune from any of these categories or none of these categories with which we are completely unfamiliar. We know what it means to experience guilt, to know depravity, to suffer, to encounter death, to feel imprisoned. And we pray that that experiential evidence would only serve to confirm what your word teaches so that we are drawn to Jesus in whom we can enjoy the restoration of all that has been lost and more. And so more than anything else tonight, Father, we pray that we would be restored to you through the Lord Jesus Christ and that by means of the Spirit you would enable us to entrust ourselves to him, believing him to be who he says he is and trusting in the work that he did and does for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.